Hello and a very warm welcome to everyone joining today's Select Science webinar titled Predicting the Crystalline Nature of APIs with a Novel Inline X-Ray Technique in Situ X. My name is Thomas Casburn and I'll be moderating today's session. In today's webinar, I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Gerard Cockerell, Head of the Separative Sciences and Methods Laboratory at the University of Rouen, Normandy. Following the presentation, we'll be moving on to our question and answer session. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to submit them at any time during the webinar. And you can do this by clicking on the purple tab on the left of your screen and then typing in your question. Without further delay, I'd like to hand over to Gerald to begin today's presentation. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, this presentation aims at creating uh, solid vapor equilibria with the help of a new technology named Institute. So first, I, I want to show you where is my university. I am a member of the University of Rouen, Normandy, and which is obviously located in Normandy. And Rouen is the capital of Normandy. So before treating the matter, I want also to introduce my laboratory, which I have created in 1997, and uh, to introduce myself also. So I, I have uh, been supervisor of uh, 51 PhD students. I publish more than 200 articles in uh, peer-reviewed journals. On top of that, I publish 11 chapter books and I filed uh, 41 patents. So my fields of expertise are detailed on this slide, but uh, let's say heterogeneous equilibria is the core of this expertise. And this is also called phase diagram. And here it's more particularly on condensed phase and solid phase identification. Crystallization of molecular species is just then a part of the, of the heterogeneous equilibria in a way that is to say the management of uh, uh, crystallization and the control of crystallization. This includes particularly chiral discrimination in the solid state and um, symmetry breaking via uh, crystallization. Supramolecular interaction also and uh, disorder in uh, molecular crystal, especially three-dimensional defects such as fluid inclusions. So this presentation today will be uh, divided in four parts, and uh, the first will be to uh, to spot the the issues to to be solved in terms of solid vapor equilibria. Okay, the second part will be devoted to the, the presentation of this institute's uh, technology. The third will be related to some examples, and then we will try to draw some uh, conclusions. So how humidity affects powder samples? That's a vast uh, question, and which can be divided in uh, several sub-questions. So that is to say, we, we can have a formation of hydrate, or by contrast, a dissolvation of hydrate, but this dissolvation could be in a multiple step. Okay, so starting from the pentahydrate, you could have a dihydrate, monohydrate, hemihydrate, and then the anhydrous form. But uh, in addition to this formation of new chemical entities, you could have also macroscopic effects such as swelling, retractation, hardening, caking, and so on. And of course, one of the major issues will be also crystallization for amorphous material or phase transitions, uh, etc. Okay? If you want to put uh, an API on the market, all of that is mandatory knowledge that the FDA and the EMA, but the Japan also um, society, uh, need to know uh, before having the, you know, the authorization to go on the market. Usually, this kind of data is obtained by dynamic vapor absorption, and you have here a schematic representation of that. So you have a, a, a sample 
very small amount, something like few milligrams, which are submitted to a flux, a flux of uh, nitrogen with a certain amount of humidity inside that we call relative humidity, and this at a very constant temperature. Okay? And uh, the data are being afterwards interpreted in terms of hydration, dehydration, or etc. And we will see the question which can be answered or not by the current technology. So here are some representation of the variation of mass versus humidity. On the top right chart, you can see starting from the Hanitus form, you, you have a, a slight increase in mass due to absorption. And then suddenly, about 60% uh, RH, you, you can see a big jump in mass, which corresponds to the crystallization of the monohydrate. Okay, based on that, again, you have some absorption, which sometimes go to deliquescence, but here it's not represented. And then if you go back, you don't use the same pathway. You go further down before you decompose the monohydrate into an anhydrous form. But the, the problem is how to be sure that after absorption desorption cycle, the same hydrate or anhydrous phase exists, okay? Because here, an anhydrous form could be uh, form one at the beginning, and then after dehydration of the monohydrate, you could have form two, okay? And the same applies for the monohydrate itself. You could have, after two or three cycles, a, a different monohydrate, which could be form. And if you have no spectroscopic data, how you can know that? Second recurrent question that we have between solid and vapor is how about the crystallinity after one of several cycles? Because you see that from those equilibria, of solid vapor equilibria, you have a stepped variation here on the bottom left okay, representation. You have the high nitrate, monohydrate, and dihydrate. But then on the way back, you don't go through the monohydrate again. Okay. So the, you have destruction of some phases. And then if you are interested, for, a, for instance, for a hydrate or anhydrate, what is the crystallinity of that? And you know that the crystallinity has something to do with the chemical stability over aging. Okay. So this is an important issue that we need to address when we are uh, looking at the long-term stability of uh, API. So now it's not a schematic representation, it's a real representation that uh, compound that we studied this year. So starting from the anhydrous form, we got the dihydrate, and then this dihydrate transformed later on on tetrahydrate. And you can see here, by, by decreasing the relative humidity down to, let's say, 30%, it's still the tetrahydrate, which is pretty stable. But then when we expected to come back first to the dihydrate and then the anhydrous form, no way, absolutely no way. And you, here, the dehydration of the tetrahydrate is particularly long, even by taking few milligrams. And uh, at industrial scale, it needs more than four days, which is a real uh, production issue then for the industrial uh, pharmaceutical company. So the same compound, then we wanted to know how the hydration of the dihydrate uh, proceed, and then we, we just stopped at 50% uh, RH and then went down again to impose to the system to go back with this short DVS cycle. And then after that, we, we, we went back to the tetrahydrate to see if after education of the solid, we could obtain these stairs back, but no way. It was again, you know, a single step from the tetrahydrate to the anhydrous form. So um, the complete knowledge 
of the behavior of a solid versus relative humidity needs really to, to be uh, scrutinized by different processes and to, to take time. And on top of that, of course, it is necessary to know what is the, the phases okay, which are involved. Because here, the dye rate in this particular case exists as two polymorphic forms. Okay. And so it is important to, to know uh, which form can exist uh, down to 50% RH. So one of all the recurrent questions is also, is it a stoichiometric or non-stoichiometric hydrate? And this is a very important question for the development of API. If you look at the DVS chart, so that is to say the mole at sol versus RH, at the bottom here, you see for the amorphous uh, antibiotic here, you, you have here a continuous exponential adsorption without any plateau. This is the usual behavior of amorphous material. Now, if you go on the top right, you will see from the anhydrous antibiotic, here you, you have this, it's not yet a plateau, but it's something which looks like a traditional isotherm here. So clearly, you have here a behavior which corresponds to a non-stoichiometric hydrate, and on sorption and desorption, you have a reversible pathway here. Now, on the top left, you have the formation of the dihydrate starting from the anhydrous form, but you see the plateau is not really flat, which means that you have probably, in addition to the particles which are amorphous particles, which are uh, pretty well crystallized. And in order to, to know if this is not simply a coating material of the particle, which is defective, and the core of the particle is a good long range order, then you, you need to, to, to have spectroscopic data again. In addition to uh, scanning electron microscopy, also images. So uh, a set of data which allows you to conclude on the na uh, genuine nature of the population of the particles that you have. So what are the technology available now to have this spectroscopic data? You can use infrared, near infrared, or Raman spectroscopy, which are already coupled with EVS. But the problem is that you have a lack of discrimination for crystalline phases. And, uh, you know, uh, to, to see, for example, if you have deviation in the peaks, it's pretty difficult also to interpret the crystalline, the evolution of the crystallinity could be difficult. Of course, the best technique for identification of crystals is definitely X-ray diffraction. So one thing you can do is just sampling. But if you sample such small mass, it will be first difficult and secondly, some phases are really efflorescent or very hygroscopic and then you modify the environment of those phases and then what you measure is not really what is existing at the RH where you made the sampling. So the best is in situ technique for sure. Okay. But for the moment you, you, you the closed chamber are available, but these closed chamber use a normal geometry of theta theta geometry and this this suppose that you, you use quite a lot of material. And second, if you have, um, let's say, swelling or retraction, those, those uh, effects will completely change the baseline, and not the, exactly the baseline, but in addition, it will change the, the zero theta, and then your data are completely not precise. Okay. So I will now present a new technology which is supposed to address perfectly those questions 
by uh, an original uh, setup called minus theta minus theta. Next slide, please. So here is presented the principle of uh, this setup. So we have a chamber which is regulated in temperature. And at the bottom of that, you have a hole which is just closed by a very thin membrane. Usually we use carton, but uh, we can use other polymers, or we can also use a polycrystalline diamond, for instance. And then we put a few milligrams of uh, powder on top of this membrane inside the chamber. A nose is um, a nozzle is um, flushing a relative humidity here in nitrogen, and all of that is made at the same temperature as the liquid of uh, the thermostat is uh, running inside the double jacket. Then we have a temperature probe, which exactly measure in the close vicinity of the powder, first the temperature, second the relative humidity. Now on the other side of the membrane, we are also flushing a gas, which is exactly at the same temperature as the liquid in the double jacket uh, reactor, and also uh, the same as the gas which is flushing on the powder. And this is also controlled accurately by a uh, uh, a system and a computer. So we can use a minute amount of milligram. We can monitor the kinetics of transformation. And what is interesting is that we are pretty much doing duplicate experiments. That is to say the same experiment with the same ramp, for example, as we can do in DVS. So it is as if you, you have the variation of mass versus RH and also the spectroscopic data. And of course, uh, the major issue is to have, as that we have solved, the exact temperature on both sides of the membrane. So this slide is uh, presenting uh, in more detail what's going on at the base of the membrane. So we have a special system of delivering uh, nitrogen which is exactly regulated, and we have that uh, the specific control of the temperature also. And this nozzle is also designed to, to be like a knife for divergent X-ray. So it has a threefold uh, use. So that's a detailed uh, plan of the, the, the base of the of the system, which avoid, you know, uh, frost and dew on the external part of the membrane. And then we, we are sure that uh, we, even when we are at uh, minus 70 uh, degrees, there is no ice and no dew on the uh, lower part of the membrane. So just to, to sum up the, you know, the interest of that technology, is that it is in situ, so you don't need any sampling. Uh, if it is toxic material, carcinogenic material, or moisture sensitive material, it's okay, you don't need to sample. You don't need to filtrate, because of course we can use also uh, the same system for crystallization in solution. That might be uh, the subject of the uh, next presentation. And uh, we could have an accurate control of the sample temperature during the experiment. So we can mimic also industrial processes, and we have an inline constant uh, monitoring of what's going on inside our reactor. So now it's time to, to move to some examples which are limited, of course, but uh, in which you will see the different interests of this technology.
So to start with, we, we, we tested our uh, technology uh, by using uh, citric acid. Citric acid exists as an anhydrous form and it exists also as a monohydrate. The DVS, I won't show this data, but you can trust me on that, a DVS is showing uh, that we have a sharp increase from the anhydrous form to the monohydrate at 73.4% RH at 25 degrees. And then, knowing that, we, we started from the anhydrous form and jumped to 65% RH, because nothing was expected up to that uh, level. And then, by uh, 2 by 2 or 1 by 1 RH, we have increased the relative humidity of the nitrogen flush on top of the one milligram sample. And then you can see that at 73 exactly, okay, 73 percent, then we start seeing, you know, the crystallization of something else, which could be identified as exactly the monohydrate. And then interestingly, with the ramp that we use here, we could see that from 73 to 78 percent, there the two phases were coexisting. But here is just a kinetic effect. If we would have used a much slower ramp, then at 73 percent, we could have completed the rehydration from anhydrous form to the monohydrate form. Also, interestingly, if you look at the uh, let's say 79, 80, and 90 percent um, pattern, uh, you can see that uh, actually the XRPD peaks are decreasing in, in intensity, which allow us to check that we enter in the deliquescence domain. Okay, So there is a one-to-one -one relationship between what we got with DVS and with this institute data. So here it's not only uh, citric acid with vapor, but we, we, with the first success that we have shown here, we were also interested in confirming where in solution we can have dehydration. I know it sounds a little bit hard to dehydrate in aqueous solution, but as soon as you are above the peritectic transition that you can see on the bottom left here, okay, with the phase diagram, from one to two, when you cross the horizontal line corresponding to the peritectic transition, above that line, you have then an heterogeneous equilibrium between saturated solution and the anhydrous form. Okay, so we can desolvate the anhydrous form in an aqueous solution, and then if all the downstream operations are kept above 37 degrees, as we will see, then you, you could have nice crystals because they have grown in solution, and then you perform filtration above 37, dry above 37, and you have nice anhydrous form without any... Um, you know, defect on your crystal. So, if you look at the institute data, you have in blue here correctly. Okay, you can see you can see the crystals here, and then after 37.5, okay, between and and 37, you you can see okay, the beginning of the anhydrous form, which appear here. And this could be identified exactly with literature. Okay, so we can see that. So of course I am uh, uh, extending a little bit only solid vapor uh, equilibria because here it's solution. But okay, it makes sense to to check the the possibility to dehydrate even in aqueous solution. Another example with an API is the nomegestrol acetate is an API used in a contraceptive field. 
crystallization of this uh, compound is performed in pure methanol. And by looking at the shape of the crystals, uh, I was a little bit puzzled to see that those crystals would be very defective, or even on the surface. And uh, so I decided to look at what's going on in the suspension. And in the suspension, you have the XRPD pattern on the left-hand side. You can see that this pattern has nothing to do because after that, on the right-hand side, it is, uh, you know, uh, simpering both with the XRPD pattern of the non-solvated phase, which was thought to grow in the reactor. I mean by that, the industrial partner didn't know that the production was going through this methanol solvent. So when you are thinking about seeding crystallization, this is important because it means that if you want to seed correctly the reactor, you have to seed by the solvent. Otherwise, there is a risk of crystallization of a metastable anhydrous space, or you have to convert the uh, non-solvated seeds into methanol solvate, and then they will give, by secondary nucleation, the population of particles which is in equilibrium in this saturated solution. So in order to tune correctly you know, um, crystallization processes, this technique is also very much important. And here you can clearly see that we are dealing with highly effervescent solvates. Another problem that uh, we had uh, to solve is a very, very simple molecule. We are interested in for uh, another topic, uh, but it is DMU, so uh, dimethyl urea. Dimethyl urea is rather hygroscopic material, and uh, it exists at uh, as a high temperature form up to fusion. And there is also a low temperature form. But if you look in the literature about where is uh, the temperature of transition of this enantiotropic transition, well, the, the literature is very conflicting. So we try to tackle that. And uh, you, you can see that we could have 41 from DSD, but we by using uh, temperature result X-ray diffraction, we got something which was just in the middle and nothing was clear about that. So we decided to investigate properly the behavior between DMU and water. So first, we tried to have uh, as dry as possible uh, heptane. So we put that on molecular sieve and then we use seven grams of dimethyl urea that we store over P205 for one month. And then we program the, you know, the, um, the suspension from 12 degrees to 46 degrees, which was supposed to be, uh, you know, an interval in which we should see the temperature of transition. Actually, actually, uh, what we we saw was uh, puzzling because uh, a temperature of transition is a unique temperature from which one crystal lattice change into another one. Here you have a, a domain in temperature where these two forms can coexist, even if clearly the low temperature form, as we increase temperature, drops in quantity and the other, the high temperature, increases. But even if we if you go very slowly, okay, and you kneel, for example, at 30 degrees, those two forms remain coexisting. So that uh, looks like a biphasic domain for two polymorphic forms. This imposes, uh, you know, uh, to have a, an invariant somewhere, okay. And then we, we look for the next invariance. Here, with uh, 800 ppm of water, we get the same problem, okay, with an intermediate zone from uh, 24 to 36, let's say, where we could see two 
polymorphic form of DMU coexisting okay, with different ratio, but they coexist. And that is not possible. Okay, so we, we decided to move again in terms of composition, that would be the last one. And then at that stage, we could see that we had what we were expecting at the beginning of that study, that is to say, a clear temperature at which we have a low temperature form and then a high temperature form and at a single temperature, which is here, 25. But 25 degrees is not the temperature of the polymorphic transition as such. It is actually the temperature of a three phase invariant at which the high temperature form okay, transform into the low temperature form and a saturated solution. All of that, of course, is, uh, you know, stuck on the left hand side because we are dealing with a, a very small amount of water due to the hygroscopicity of this material. But in order to understand the behavior of DMU versus humidity and temperature transition, we need to have this spectroscopic data. So that's the sum up of what we did, you know, three different compositions. And this is a schematic uh, representation because all of that, of course, is very much close to, to the pure DMU. And then we think that the temperature of transition of DMU, I mean, without moisture, is something between 56 and 58 degrees. The other interest of this uh, technology is also to spot hydrates or solvate or any kind of uh, compound of new phases which exist at low temperature. And with DMU and water, for example, we spotted a monohydrate which exists at up to 8 degrees C. Okay, the pre-technic transition is at 8 degrees C. Below that, the monohydrate exists. Above, it doesn't. With uh, potassium formate uh, and water, we could spot uh, you know, a hydrate uh, starting from minus 3. And of course, we can investigate that down to a temperature of minus 70 degrees. So what is the interest of, of that? So it could have an impact on freeze drying, because if you want to perform freeze drying, you don't want any hydrate to form, class rate formation, and low temperature crystallization. I mean, we mean by that uh, beneath uh, room temperature. And then we, you can miss some very interesting opportunity to purify a compound because you didn't check that at zero degree C or minus five, you got a nice phase which can crystallize and which provides a high purification effect. So looking at low temperature is something which should be a routine for uh, chemical engineer. This will be my last uh, example. Okay, and so uh, that's the story of uh, Rimonabon, which was uh, an API developed by Sanofi Adventis, and which has been uh, withdrawn in 2008 for light uh, side effects. So this uh, API uh, gives two polymorphic forms at high temperature, let's say around 170 degrees, and a lot of different solvates, like we can see now for many uh, new API uh, recently developed. Among those uh, solvates, we, we could uh, found, we could find, sorry, uh, um, a monohydrate. This monohydrate is detailed here by those projections. On the top left, you can see channels in which uh, we have uh, you know, this hydrate. And we can see a uh, projection along uh, another um, axis here. OK, you see this A is put flat on the screen. And on the right hand side, it's a schema schematic representation where you can see that we have two molecules in their symmetric units 
and we have also uh, you know, this ribbon of, uh, of water molecules which connect A and B molecules along B axis. What is important here is to see the A axis along which we could, we could have a coherent uh, departure of water molecules along this channel. Here is a uh, detail of the thermal behavior of this monohydrate. This monohydrate loses its uh, water molecule pretty much at low temperature, something like uh, 30, 40 degrees, and you have a large endothermic uh, phenomenon, okay, corresponding, because you can see the TGA simultaneously, you can see the loss of mass, 3.9%, uh, which fits pretty well with the theoretical value of 3.74. But after, you can clearly see another phenomenon, which is not correlated with a loss of mass, with a phenomenon as absorption of any solvent or chemical degradation. Okay. And we were puzzled by that because of what it is all about. Okay. And then, of course, we needed more uh, data to interpret this second phenomenon. So, have reproduced it. DSC TGA at the bottom of this slide, but above you can see a uh, temperature result x ray powder diffraction. And you can see that this monohydrate remains stable up to the moment where you have almost a complete uh, diffraction of the crystal lattice, and you have something which is simply amorphous. Okay, So it looks like you know, we have uh, something which is molten uh, at the temperature of 100 degrees. And after, we don't see any recrystallization of that, even if we waited a long period of time to promote that. And here, I hope you can see that uh, actually from this new material, we, we, we performed first the DSC that we stopped at 100 degrees, and we clearly see now, the, uh, after this melting, we can see the TG, okay, so it's a glass transition, which is at circa 77 degrees C, and if, after cooling, we make uh, heating again, and but then up to high temperature, about 180 degrees, and then we have a recrystallization before melting. And this is a recrystallization of one of the two normal, let's say, polymorphic forms. So we have a glass transition at 77 degrees, which means that if we perform dissolvation below that temperature, we can then remove the water molecule without having the, a, a good mobility of the molecule, and then it might be possible to freeze the scaffolding of this, um, of this crystal lattice for at least a, a period of time with a transmission of structural information from the mon initial monohydrate to this final dehydrated phase. And then what we did is indeed to perform dehydration at a relatively low temperature, for sure, below the uh, glass transition. And here you can see those needles, low needles along the A-axis, which you remember correspond to the channel in which the water molecules are situated. And then by heating only at 60 degrees, here we could see that from a transparent crystal, we get uh, here translucid crystals. And then by magnifying those crystals that we get by this very soft dehydration at 60 degrees, we could see that we induce cracks, okay, which means that water molecule could find, by using defect in the crystal, the shortcut to get out of the needle without making a long voyage inside the needle or right to the tip of the needle.
So by using in-situ, uh, yeah, uh, we could see that indeed by performing the desolvation at low temperature, we could form a phase which was, okay, exhibiting a clear structural affiliation with the initial hydrate. On top of that, this was reversible. So we could go back and forth, okay, at the expense of the crystallinity in some way, but we could go back and forth from the dehydrated phase, which was crystallized, okay, to the monohydrate again. So now, by knowing this spectroscopy data that we obtain in situ, it would be possible to reinterpret. So uh, now we have the DVS study, precise DVS study, I should say, of Remonabon starting from the monohydrate. It is important to start from the monohydrate that we prepared from the acetone water mixture. And then this monohydrate, you, you see it's extremely stable because it's uh, below 5% RH at 20 degrees that you have a sharp decomposition into uh, you know, the anhydrous form. But this anhydrous form is the one which is crystallized. It's not the amorphous one. And it has a clear structural affiliation with the monohydrate. And then if you increase the relative humidity up to 10%, this metastable anhydrate keep, uh, you know, being crystallized and keep being metastable, but uh, it still exists. And then if you reach 14%, then you have a sharp increase. It means that, that you have a recrystallization into the monohydrate that we knew before. Of course, the crystallinity is not as good as it was before, but then after two cycles, you, you, you get a steady state with small particles of this monohydrate. Besides that, you can see that if you go to the amorphous material, that is to say you go to 100 degrees to make your complete dehydration and fusion of this metastable anhydrous form, then it's hopeless to, to, to prepare Again, even if it is amorphous, up to 90%, you cannot reproduce crystallization of the monohydrate. And then, of course, you cannot have the metastable anhydrate phase, because this metastable anhydrate phase could form only if you have the uh, initial hydrate. And this, all of that, this consistent set of data, which are thermodynamics, DVS, and so on, and uh, spectroscopic is gives a, a consistent interpretation. So now we can also interpret the uh, you know TGA DDS uh, TGA DSC sorry uh, data. So we know the large you know first phenomenon on DSC and then the second one which corresponds to melting. Of course, if you stop after the first one. Then you have an anhydrous form which is affiliated with the initial monohydrate and which melts at a temperature which is more than 70 degrees below the temperature of the two term of the two forms which were known before knowing this monohydrate. And this is also something which makes sense in terms of global understanding the behavior of a solid versus a vapor. So to sum up uh, what we, we look at, okay, so Institute uh, technology uh, allows the chemical engineer to understand the behavior of uh, solids, okay, versus, you know, RH, versus condition, different condition of crystallization, and without any sample, okay. And of course, with by this technique, which is precise and doesn't need a lot of material, we can monitor solid-solid transition of all sorts, such as polymorphism, desolvation, and resolvation, and to check the crystallinity of that, co-crystallization, 
uh, host guest association, crystallization of cloud traits, the kinetics associated with this solid solid transition, the evolution of prestability, and the stoichiometric or non stoichiometric character of these hydrates. Now it's time to thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Gerard, for that excellent presenta presentation. It's, so it's now time for our question and answer session. Um, so if you have any questions for our speaker, please do send them in now. And you can do that using the purple tab on the left of your screen. Um, so we've had a few questions come in already. And the first one here is, could you use in situ X for solvates dif different from hydrates? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, as long as the solvent is volatile enough, it's possible to use a mixture of solvents to crystallize heterosolvate or mixed solvates. These phases enlarge the possibility to purify an API or to access to a particular crystalline form after dissolvation, as we demonstrated with our baclofen. It is just an accepted article in Journal of Pharmaceutical Sciences. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, we have another question here, and that is, did you ever observe a swap for a solvate to a hydrate by flushing dinitrogen above a threshold in relative humidity? Uh, this is an interesting question when dissolvation is an issue. I mean that uh, dissolvation is difficult and uh, the chemical stability of the compound is uh, jeopardized. So I remember the problem that we got uh, with the diisopropyl ether solvate. Solid state NMR gave evidence of very strong bond with an amine group. And here we could, by flushing actually nitrogen with a certain amount of relative humidity, we could flush out the, the diisopropyl ether molecules. Excellent, thank you for that. And a, the next question is, is it possible to use other relative humidity ramps rather than those used in DVS? Uh, yes, of course. And it is beneficial for kinetics uh, study and to spot uh, possible uh, metastable phases. For instance, uh, fast and slow dissolvations can uh, deliver different subhydrates uh, for instance, uh, if you take uh, isomeprazole uh, magnesium hydrate, here you have uh, one hexahydrate, one tetrahydrate, one trihydrate, four different dihydrates, and two monohydrates, etc. So you have families of uh, hydrates. And uh, depending on the kinetics that you use, you could uh, see some of them jumping from one to another or you could have different pathways uh, to, to jump from one of them to another one and so on. So it, it, it seems that you, you have a landscape and then you, by different kinetics, you, you can visit you know, some kind of uh, places in this landscape or another uh, type of uh, places. Fantastic, thank you for that clarification. Um, and another question here, and that's at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned different phenomena such as uh, deliquilescence, effervescence, caking, retraction, swelling, etc. How can in situ X help to diagnose those phenomena with with certainty? Uh, that's a vast question, of course. Uh, so um, deliquescence means that the powder obtains moisture up to dissolution, partial or total dissolution of the API. So the intensity of the XRPD peaks drops as the deliquescence proceeds. And when you have complete dissolution, of course, you have no more any peaks, okay? So under a certain threshold of humidity, the solvate cannot survive. So it releases the water molecules, leaving subsolvate or 
non-solvated phases, which means that we call that efflorescence. Okay, and uh, most of the time you have swelling of the powder that I mentioned already. Now you could have refraction, caking, and other things which could be also optically monitored. Okay, and this uh, this the philosophy of institutes is also to use uh, other technology compatible, uh, and then such as camera, near infrared, and so on. So. You, you have all the kind of information necessary to, to give a good interpretation. Excellent, thank you for that. So our next question is, when a temperature of transition changes by different relative humidity, you said that there is a solid solution of water in the compound. Is this always true? Yes, it is indeed always uh, true. And uh, I published some years ago a paper detailing that. So in case uh, you are interested in that, I can send you uh, the reference. So let us suppose that uh, there is a polymorphic transition at uh, T0, let's say. If the temperature of transition fluctuates, it means that uh, there are at least one of the two polymorphs which give a solid solution with another component. For example, in, if we take into account uh, the, the effect of water with the uh, dimethyl urea that I have exposed uh, during this uh, presentation, the second component, which is here, water, at uh, hundreds of ppm level, it uh, could be enough to decrease the temperature of transition by uh, 25 degrees. And uh, some other authors have shown the similar phenomena with uh, ammonium nitrate, uh, also with water. So I uh, insist, if you have a, a temperature of transition between two polymorphs, which can fluctuate, it means that at least one of the two forms, maybe the, both of them, give a solid solution with the water. Fantastic. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, my next question uh, is regarding slide eight, and it is, are the structural affiliations mandatory for a reversibility of the hydration dehydration phenomena? Um, not really. Not, we, we don't need a structural affiliation. This is, this is uh, something which happens from time to time, and um, but in the majority of the cases, we observe a nucleation and crystal growth uh, phenomena, which are consistent with the esterisis uh, cycle. But the significant number of cases also correspond to non stoichiometric hydrates, which means that the single phase is adaptable to the relative humidity in the environment. So it's the same phase which is able to uptake more water molecule or to release those water molecule, adjusting the composition in water with the environment. Okay, so of course this is completely different from a stoichiometric hydrate, which will remain stoichiometric and then um, up to a certain threshold where it, where it releases its water molecule. So for the, the last case, it's black and white, for the non stoichiometric hydrate, you have all the different gray uh, possibilities between white and black. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, my next question is, did you observe a significant drop in crystallinity upon several dehydration and rehydration cycles? Uh, yes, indeed. Um, humidity stress induces some kind of noise in the long range order. So usually the first cycles, I mean the first one, second one, and sometimes third one, but uh, especially the first one, uh, those cycles, the first one, are in detrimental to the crystallinity. And then the, after a few cycles, you reach some kind of plateau in the long range order and we don't see much, um, let's say, evolution afterwards.
Excellent, thank you. So we have time for just a few more questions. Um, and the next one is, please explain the detector and its technical details used in in-situ X. How, uh, and also, how precisely can we quantify the different phase? Okay, so actually there are two questions here. Yeah, the, the detector that we use is uh, a fast one. Okay, so the, it is a linked pipe. And uh, this um, allows us to have a XRPD pattern within six minutes. Okay, so um, that's important. Uh, about the second part of the question, uh, identification of a mixture of phases and quantification. That's uh, already in also two questions in the one with one. So the, the first thing is to make sure that it's really uh, not a unique uh, phase. So we could have a mixture if we can make sure that uh, there are different crystal lattices. And it's not the same crystal lattice which is evolving. And then it's good to have uh, only a few amount of milligram because then we we don't uh, we don't have the you know the, the difficulty to to have a non equilibrium. Okay. The second interest to have few milligrams, so the small quantity, is also that we use the same quantity as the one we use with DBS. So from DBS to institutes, it's really duplication. Okay, and that's, that makes sense uh, for us to compare the DBS data and the XRPD institute data. So about quantification, now uh, that's also a, a problem because as we are uh, imposing humidity stress, the relative intensity of the peak, even if there, it is the same phase, would vary. Okay, because the preferential orientation will change. So um, here, if there is no such effect which uh, corresponds to additional difficulty, it will be possible to indeed compare the relative intensity of two different phases, for example, to make a, a simple monohydrate and anhydrous, and then to check the, the relative amount of one and the other, and to have then the kinetic uh, data about uh, this transformation. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Um, our next question here is, can we use this technique for the characterization of nanofilm coatings? Uh, we have not yet tested that, but we will be happy to do it. And um, so, so the problem that I can uh, anticipate will be to, to have a um, grazing almost uh, incident. And uh, for the moment, we cannot go, uh, let's say, below 2.5 uh, degree uh, to see that. Okay, thank you very much. And a, another question here that is, can we study dehydrate and hydrate forms of the solid and liquid simultaneously? Uh, I, I do not understand actually the question about dehydration of a liquid uh, because it is X-ray diffraction. X-ray diffraction can only see, uh, you know, when it is a solid and the solid which is crystallized. So it means that we, we have a long range order. Um, normally, yes, yep. we, we can monitor the, 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 the dehydration process very well. Perfect, thank you. Uh, so we've got time for just one more question, and that is, can we calculate the percentage crystallinity by this technique? Yes, yes, because we can, uh, we can make precise and uh, long acquisition of uh, if we block the temperature and the relative humidity after a few cycles, for example, we can say, well, we want to know here the crystallinity of the phase and the evolution after one cycle, two cycles, etc. And then that will be indeed possible to do it. Fantastic. Okay, thank you. 
So I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. Um, so thank you again for your excellent presentation and that discussion. And thank you to everyone joining us online and for sending in your questions. If we didn't have enough time to answer your questions, uh, we will follow up with these after today's event. So if you have any more questions, please feel free to submit them now using the purple tab on the left of your screen or email me at editor at selectscience.net and I will follow up on these. Remember, you can also download a certificate of attendance in the related resources tab indicated by the file icon on the left of your screen. As always, if you'd like to listen again to today's webinar or invite a friend to listen, it will be available to watch on demand in a few days time. So thank you again, um, Gerard, and goodbye and thank you for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.